Good morning and welcome to worship. A special welcome to visitors that are here. We're happy to have you. Whether you're in person here or online, as we together pr praise our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is the second Sunday in the season of Lent. Our reader today is Marcia Stinson. Special music is Tom and Joy Olson. Flowers are given today by Pat Cooper to the sovereignty and faithfulness of God and by Diane Monroe in loving memory of Jack Monroe. The eternal candle is given this month by Patty and Clark Field in celebration of life and all its blessings. We continue to worship during Lent midweek at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays. You don't need to RSVP. Come and sit wherever you like. We're talking about prayer and empowering prayer, and this Wednesday is the disoriented prayer, that is, lament. It's a half-hour service. A note to our YouTube audience. We have noticed some sound issues. We have changed our video recording software, experimenting with another kind, and it has worked. But um, the upload time after worship is a little longer. So if you're not on the live stream, if you hear the live stream, you'll have good sound. If you don't get to the service till later, it may not be up until noon. From the outreach team, Today is the last Sunday to collect coats. Thank you for your overwhelming generosity. It was a complete success. Also, for the second harvest, it is soup this month. Messiah Book Club is reading a book called Becoming Mrs. Lewis. More details to come. And um, a few notes just about our congregation. We haven't seen some people here for a while, and uh, Mac Oliver is here, so resist the urge to hug Mac. He's not been to church for a year because he's waited until he's gotten the vaccine. So we're blessed to see Mac, but remember to social distance. Also the Mowers are here from New York in the back pew. Great to see you Mowers, welcome back. I got a note from Marcy Perry, one of our founding members. She said she's enjoying the on online worship. I also talked to Anjan Blanc, one of our online worshipers as well. Many of you may remember her husband, the Reverend Dean John Blanc. His son passed away, Wesley, so we remember all those in the Jean Blanc family as um, they grieve. It is the second Sunday in the season of Lent, and our gospel reading takes a hard turn. Jesus talks about discipleship and the cost of discipleship and denying the self and giving up one's own life for Jesus. So we will talk about the way of the cross today in this sermon. So let us now have a time of centering and reflection during the prelude. Thank you. 
Please stand for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. God hears us when we cry and draws close to us in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Build what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Amen. Remain standing for the gathering psalm. Let us pray. O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us to glory in the cross of Christ, that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
The first reading is from Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant to you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come to you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after, after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come to her. The word of the Lord. The psalm is from Psalm 23. You who fear the Lord give praise. All you of Jacob's line give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow down before God. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down and worship. All who go down in the dust to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. The second reading is from Romans 4. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the Lord who are to be the heirs, faith is null and promises void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, 
but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Mark. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous gener and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of our Lord. You, Brothers and sisters in Christ, you may be familiar with the term mid-course correction where as you are navigating, you are aiming for one spot and then you realize at some point in the middle of your journey that you need to change exactly the angle where you are headed to get where your destination. So in ships, they might follow a star at night, keep on sailing and then realize that they need to adjust. Or imagine as uh, this past week where we heard the news of the rover landing on Mars, how that fraction of a degree matters, how we get something from this planet to neighboring Mars landing successfully. Sometimes you need to adjust to get to where you're headed. Incidentally, I had a friend last week tell me that someone in church asked that the during worship that they pray for those astronauts on Mars. Well, no, it was a rover. No astronauts went there, but appreciate the concern. We um, need to make mid-course corrections in life, where we harbor certain notions or certain attitudes or certain direction, and we realize we need to change. We need to alter where we're headed if we want to get to where we really want to go. We meet a mid-course correction in a dramatic way in our Gospel reading today. Poor Peter was headed in the right direction just before this reading. Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Christ. And he got that right. But then, Jesus talked about things that Peter nor we want to hear, that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and be killed and rise again. And Peter didn't like hearing that. Peter wanted to correct the record, but actually he was the one that needed the mid-course correction. Jesus rebuked Peter. And then Jesus 
sets things on the right path, the correct destination, the correct frame of mind. If you want to become my followers, then deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Hard words from Jesus today, honest words, words that make us uncomfortable. What do you mean we need to deny ourselves? What do you mean that suffering is involved with God? What about losing our life? I thought we were supposed to keep our lives and make lives better. Isn't Jesus supposed to make life easier or more comfortable or more grandiose? No, course correction. That's not the way of Jesus and not the way of the cross. Peter's thinking prior to this, he watched Jesus do miracles and best his challengers from the religious establishment and even walk on water. And Peter thought that's what things are going to look like with this Jesus who is the Messiah. But oh no, there's more to Jesus than just those grand things. And that's what we look at today. And in doing so, we need to look at our own assumptions and attitudes about Jesus and about the church. You know, I admit to falling pray to Peter's thinking all the time. I used to say, I wish there'd be more Lutherans and Lutheran pastors in television shows. And then I watch a show called The Mindy, Mindy Problem. Mindy Kaling is a comedian and writer, got famous from The Office, and she's the main character in this show in Hulu, and she meets and falls in love with a Lutheran pastor in New York City. And I am so happy to see this plot line. But the problem is, the guy is a jerk. And I was so embarrassed. And Jesus says, be careful. We here in the American church, no longer standing prominently at the center of the culture, but pushed to the side, we scramble for legitimacy. We gussy up our presentations to become more culturally relevant with logos and biblical principles for a better life and more justice and more seek, more peace, seeking to um, reinvent ourselves, chasing anything that might get a few more people in our building, which is all fine and good and understandable, but the question always needs to be asked, where is Jesus in our efforts? Many of you may know of author Flannery O'Connor. She's from here in Savannah. Her home is now a museum dedicated to her. She places downtown uh, Savannah on Lafayette Square next to the cathedral. Flannery O'Connor is this beautiful combination of Southern and Irish and Roman Catholic. Born in 1925, she had a critical eye of the South and all the characters here, especially pertaining to religion. Flannery O'Connor is an acquired taste. When I moved to Georgia in 2003, I said, well, I have to like Flannery O'Connor now, and I tried to read her books, and they were hard to read. You need to start with her short stories. Well, she has this novella called Wise Blood with a preacher named Hazel Motes, who preaches church without Christ, where nobody sheds blood and there's no redemption because there ain't no sin to redeem and what's dead stays that way. She's describing Christianity 
without suffering, denial, and discipleship. She describes what Peter wants, the fun and the miracles and the glory with no cost. This passage, this section of Mark, is something of a mid-course correction in Mark's gospel. Jesus is popular. He, the throngs of people are following him for healings. And then he says, there's more to this than the miracles, than my power. And this passage points us to Martin Luther's contrast between what he called a theology of glory and a theology of the cross. The theology of glory is built on what appears to be self-evident about life and on assumptions about the way God is expected to act in the world. The theology of the cross, however, is grounded in God's self-revelation, in the weakness and suffering and death of Jesus. The theology of glory confirms what people, Peter, me and you want in God. The theology of the cross contradicts everything that people might imagine God should be. He brought out this argument early in his ministry in 1518 at something called the Heidelberg Disputation, where he says that the theology of God looks upon the invisible things of God as though they were clearly perceptible in things which have actually happened whereas the theology of the cross comprehends the visible and manifest things of God as seen through the suffering of Christ and the cross. We might think God is mighty and powerful and flexes his muscle in the world, but for Luther, to know God truly is to know God in Christ, which means to know God hidden in suffering. A the theology of glory prefers accomplishment and impact to suffering. Glory to the cross, wisdom to folly, and thus evil to good. The theology of the cross knows God only in Christ and him crucified. In short, the way things should be is not the way of God, as Jesus shows Peter. God's self-revelation comes under the form of the cross and thus appears as foolishness and weakness to a world that looks for wisdom and strength in God. As 1 Corinthians says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the truth about God contradicts what we expect about our own feelings about the divinity. The truth is, is that God's mercy is given to sinners, not reserved for the righteous. That God's strength is exposed in weakness, not displayed in power, that God's wisdom is shadowy and elusive and mysterious in parables and even paradox, not set out in self-help sayings. God's life, well, it's disclosed in death. Thus, it is that Jesus says, who want to save their life, the theology of glory will lose it. And those who want to lose their life for the sake of the gospel, the theology of the cross, will save it. God is not confirmed to human expectations or desires, for God is found in unseemly things like uncertainty, danger, and suffering, exactly where human wisdom perceives God's absence. So, the theology of the cross is difficult to integrate with our own very basic 
American, if not human, appetite for striving and success and effectiveness in corporate life, personal fulfillment and deliverance from pain and decisive influence in national politics. We want Jesus to be a means to these ends. And well, Jesus doesn't roll this way as our gospel readings show today. This passage shows us there's a whole lot more going on and following Jesus than simply being nice to people. Michael Horton wrote a book called Christless Christianity, the Alternative Gospel of the American Church, and he says Jesus was not a revolutionary because he said we should love God and each other. Moses said that, Buddha, Confucius, and countless other religious leaders we've heard of, even Madonna, Oprah, Dr. Phil, and the Dalai Lama, and lots of other Christian leaders will point out that the, the whole point of religion is to love each other. But God loves you doesn't stir the world's opposition. However, start talking about God's absolute authority, holiness, Christ's substitutionary atonement, that is that he died for you and me, justification apart from works, the necessity of new birth, Things like repentance, baptism, communion, and future judgment. And the mood in the room changes considerably. So what do we do with all these, this contrast of what we want and what Jesus offers? Well, following Jesus' lead today, we need to look at the ego and its demands for glory. As long as the self reigns, we will be forever trying to seek painless shortcuts to the kingdom of God. We will try and try again to substitute other ways for the way of the cross. As my teacher Gerhard Ferdy put it in his book on being a theologian of the cross, we sinners are like addicts addicted to ourselves and our own projects. The theology of glory simply seeks to give those projects eternal legitimacy. The remedy for the theology of glory, therefore, cannot be encouragement and positive thinking, but rather the end of addictive desire. Luther says it directly, the remedy for curing desire does not lie in satisfying it, but extinguishing it. So we are back to the cross, the radical intervention, end of the life of the old, and the beginning of the new. Only when we deny ourselves and take up the cross can we really follow Jesus. What about grace? Yes, grace is free. It's not as if we have to become Olympic Christians and start denying ourselves and invoke suffering upon ourselves so that we can go to heaven. Instead, Jesus meets us like he met the disciples, inviting us, calling us in our baptism to follow him. And along the way, he shows us the depth of our relationship with him. But that relationship came at a cost. And today we recognize that. And we recognize Peter's instincts that may lead us astray. As I struggle for analogies, I can only say this. Like any lasting relationship of any depth, be it a long friendship or a familial relationship or marriage, living in relationship involves both parties living sacrificially, giving up the self for the sake of the other, other for the betterment of the relationship. Jesus gave himself for you. You, in response, give yourself up for him. What does that mean? Well, give up your ego, your way, your agenda, your comfort, even your peace of mind sometimes, denying yourself. And in the process, within the challenge, you become more Christ-like. You become more like him through his 
power. I can say that in my life, it has not been easier because of Jesus, but it has been better, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. All our efforts to make another way, our denial of the one who showed us the way, the way of the cross, this true learning from Jesus, this true discipleship, True messiahship and true following are deeply connected. When we are finally willing to put down our ego and accept Jesus for who he is, the suffering one who lays down his life for others, then we can understand who we are to be, the denying self. We can take up our cross and follow him. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen. confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is at the right hand of the Father. You will know who comes judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Let us pray. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give faith to all the baptized, that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God. O God, all you rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice between the nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities. We cannot vision. Hear us, O oh God. In Jesus, you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. We remember those who are ill, especially praying for Anne Green, Helen Sillis, Hannah, Shirley Neck, and Grace Baucus. Hear us, O oh God. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. 
Console those who deal with hardship, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministries and services to families. Hear us, O oh God. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. We pray for those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Wesley Jean Blanc. Hear us, O oh God. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue with communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God, Lord God, might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Jesus draws the whole world to himself. Come to this meal and be fed. You may be seated as we distribute. Let me know if you need grape juice by giving me a sign like that.
good for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. You want to get me? Please stand. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our bare lives bear witness to the love that has been made us, made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, free to see, serve your neighbor. God bless you, that you may be a blessing. In the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity, amen. Remain standing for the sending song. Thank you. 